Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you tonight. The rain came down, didn't it? But Lord knows we need it. And you're here anyway. Praise God. Even in the rain, there's no better place to be on a Sunday night than here in the house of the Lord, surrounded by fellow believers. Amen. Why don't we all stand together tonight? We're going to sing some songs. We're going to hear from the word of God. And we're going to be blessed this Sunday night, for there's no better place for us to be. Amen. This is a new song we did a while ago. Let's see if you remember it. Here we go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God is for me, He's right again. Don't let go of their hand until they do. Pastor says y'all weren't good enough on that song. He said we need to do it again. Here we go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. He's not against me, I will hold to the plans He has for me, and when I'm broken, He will fix me, I will call on the name of the Lord. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Sing wherever I go. He's my heart song in my 
for tomorrow when the storms rise all around me i will call on the name of the lord tonight. The Bible says the joy of the Lord shows forth in everything we do, including on our countenance. Amen. When the joy of the Lord is in you, you just kind of can't help but when you come into the house of the Lord to smile and to be grateful for where you are. And it's because of Jesus' grace that we are able to be here tonight. Amen. Because of the Lord's grace and mercy upon our lives tonight. Let's lift this up tonight. Amazing grace, how sweet Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught.
thankful for his grace. Yes, amen. Praise the Lord. What amazing grace. It's his grace that was offered to us, and we were saved. Aren't you thankful for that? May, that never, may we never get tired of singing amazing grace, right? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, right? Well, welcome to church. We're glad to see all of you tonight. Glad that you're here, and uh, looking forward to what God has for us from his word. And uh, we've got missions moment tonight, kind of something different. Uh, we've got some of our students from MCA. They're going to give reports of some of the uh, missionary kids. So that's going to be a great uh, thing tonight. We're going to enjoy that together, okay? Let's bow in prayer and ask the Lord to meet with us. And Brother Tony Cardenas, would you open us up with a word of prayer, sir? Amen. Yes, God. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated, and it is good to see you tonight. Let me just give you a few prayer requests and uh, now, uh, just to kind of give you these, and, uh, and then we'll certainly pray uh, before we are dismissed tonight for these. Continue to pray for Brother Hugo. He was in the hospital for a few days uh, this past week, so it was a real difficult week for them. He did come home. He's doing somewhat better, um, but we need to lift him up to the Lord. He's got to see a cardiologist and some heart issues, and so let's just pray for that, okay? And Ms. Sheila, of course, is still trying to recover from being sick, so just a lot of things uh, going on. So let's remember them in prayer and uh, to do that also, okay? Uh, Jen Martinez, uh, Wednesday had surgery on uh, her thyroid, and so she's recovering from that. So let's pray for for Jen, and uh, I think she uh, will go back uh, sometime this week, but she's going to get results from that, and so we're certainly praying for uh, good results, uh, but certainly uh, she has great peace from God as to whatever it is and take care of that, and so let's lift her up in prayer and uh, certainly pray for her in that uh, recovery process, okay? And then, uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, Brother Ron Chaffield's aunt passed away, 92 years old. Her name's Evelyn Halliday. And so pray for the service to come on June the 2nd and uh, continue to lift up that family in prayer, as well as others in our congregation that are going through some sickness and some different things. We'll continue to pray for them also, okay? And don't forget, Wednesday night, this coming week, uh, is our WANA Awards Night. And so uh, don't think, well, I don't have any kids in WANA. Uh, we want to cheer them on, amen? Did y'all hear what I just said? Hold on a second. Hold on. Wait. Oh, it's the 31st. It's not this Wednesday. Sorry. It's a week from Wednesday. Okay. I'm a week ahead. Did I say that this morning and nobody corrected me? Anyway, you're going to come on the 31st and cheer them on, right? Okay, good. <laughs> what is this Wednesday? No, it's not, is it? Okay, come back Wednesday night. We're going to have Bible study time and then our, our middle school, high school, our young adults, uh, Awana. And they'll be able to say, I think, scriptures up until 
Is this Wednesday night, the last week? And then on the 31st, you're going to have that. So that's a week from Wednesday. So scratch that off, all right? I'm a week ahead. Uh, uh, we are closing out our second year here at MCA this week. Uh, to God be the glory. Uh, we have made it through another year. So hallelujah. With that being said, last week we graduated nine kindergartners uh, last Tuesday evening, and this week on Friday night we're going we're gonna to graduate our two seniors. And so, uh, yay, there they are right there. So uh, Chase and Eddie are two seniors. So uh, I want to invite you to come out and uh, support them if you can and uh, be here at 7 o'clock on Friday night and uh, looking for a great time as we graduate two of those. And uh, this will be a five that we've seen in two years that we graduate from uh, Macaulay Christian Academy. And so what a great, great thing. And uh, God has been so good to us uh, just after two years. And uh, I'm excited about the fact because we have numerous families that will be joining us next year and their kids and have a chance to minister to them. And uh, so uh, that's an exciting, exciting thing. And so I'm thrilled about that, okay? Uh, this morning we gave an announcement about VBS. And uh, we have that video. Do we have that on there? Why don't you show that again? If you were not in here this morning, many of you were out working and serving different areas. Uh, watch this about our VBS is coming up very soon. Light. Darkness. Good. Evil. Truth. Lies. We are engaged in an epic battle between two spiritual kingdoms for the hearts and minds of our youth. Every day our kids are bombarded with lies about who they are, who their creator is, what is right, and where their salvation comes from. But we are not meant to fight this battle alone. God, the ruler of the good kingdom, has given his kingdom keepers spiritual armor to wear. With this VBS, your kids will learn how they can be a part of God's kingdom through salvation in his son, and they will be equipped with the armor of God as they train to become keepers of the kingdom who stand strong in today's battle for truth. Huzzah! Standing Strong in Today's Battle for Truth. This is going to be a great series, and uh, we, are, we are looking for a great time. With that being said, there is a QR code in the bulletin. If you didn't get one, there's some out, uh, but you can scan that and uh, go on to volunteer. Uh, so just, it'll take you to a page. You go down to volunteer, click that button, fill out the information, and that goes directly to our VBS director. Would you give her a hand there, Miss Irene Fabian? And I tell you, we, we sat down this week. She has gone through the curriculum, and I'm telling you, she knows this as well as I said this morning. This is probably some of the best curriculum for our young people in this day and age that there is. And so we have tried to do some things to kind of help uh, put it across because this is needed in all the grades uh, standing for truth. How, what is truth? Uh, we, we, are, uh, we are in what's called the screen generation. Do you all know that? How to raise the screen generation. In fact, that's a sermon title that uh, either this next Sunday or the Sunday after, I hadn't decided when, as part of our family series. Uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you raise kids in the screen generation? Uh, this, is what they, this is where they get all their information. Their phone right there. And uh, I, I was uh, in a store yesterday, and I saw this little boy, and I heard his mom tell another lady in the store, he was four years old, and he had his own phone. Can you even read at four? What are you looking at? Looking at pictures. Shaping his young mind with what he's looking at. And so I tell you what, we're, and the devil is using that more than anything else. So they're getting... Young people as well as young kids, as young as four-year-olds, getting their uh, truth, their information, what they think is truth, from 
the screen. So this is going to talk about how we know what truth is, and it comes from the Word of God. But we need a lot of helpers. And so uh, Monday through Friday, it's going to be 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, and then on the Sunday, which I believe is the 30th, uh, we're going to have Carnival Sunday, where we inv invite all those kids to come back. We give free tickets. But most importantly, we want their parents and their families to come so we can give them the gospel and introduce them to uh, the hospital for the hurting, which is right here, right? And so uh, we certainly need a lot of help. And so I want you to do, uh, I don't think you need to pray about it, okay? I'm not going to say pray about it. I don't think you need to pray about it. Just sign up and volunteer and uh, give God that week. Let's see God do some amazing things in these kids and young people that come. And uh, God will do it, okay? So help us out with that, and that will help Miss Irene to get everything organized and ready to go. It's not until July, July the 24th or the 28th, but we are starting now to get everything ready and uh, to have a, the greatest VBS we've ever had, okay? Uh, next Sunday is Graduate Sunday, and so uh, I want you to make sure that if you have a graduate, uh, get that information to us so we can prepare the, the uh, video and all the stuff that we're going to do for them next Sunday. And I'm, I didn't mention this morning, but we're going to do something different this year for our graduating seniors, and I believe we have seven of them here in our church, uh, high school and college graduates. Uh, but when you come in next Sunday, in the foyer, there's going to be some tables set up, and there's going to be Bibles there, uh, and uh, there's going to be some signs to direct you. Here's what we're doing. They're, they're called note-takers Bibles. You ever seen those? Uh, but I got this idea, and I thought, this is a great idea. There's going to be some highlighters there. And what we want you to do is for each of those seniors to go and highlight a specific verse, maybe that God gives you, or maybe you think about it this week. And uh, when you come in, go to that scripture, highlight it, and then next to it, there's a column of lines that you can go in and write a special note to them. And we're going to present those to them uh, because you know what? God's word does not return void. One of the greatest things that we can give our graduating young people is a Bible and isn't it cool that they can have notes from you, their church family, saying whatever, hey, take this verse, I've used this verse, this verse has, has brought me great joy or, or comfort or whatever. And you know what? I guarantee you there's going to be days in their life where they'll turn to that note taker's Bible and see where somebody said and, and highlighted a verse for them. Isn't that good? And so uh, be watching for that. We'll, have a, we'll be doing that next week and depending on how many how much time we have, we may leave it up for another week. That way, anybody that wants to do that and have a chance. So be ready for that. That's going to be a great thing we're going to do for them also, okay? Uh, one other announcement, coffee station volunteers. How many of y'all love our coffee? You like coffee, okay? Well, we need some volunteers, okay? It's not, it doesn't take much. It's Sunday morning. Uh, you have to come a little bit earlier and make sure that uh, you run the coffee station back there and then at the appropriate time, kind of close it down, clean up a little bit, and go on your way. And so anybody can do that. And if you're interested in that, uh, let us know, and we need to cover that also, okay? All right, so Brother Rick, uh, last time we did this, you explained what they're doing, but uh, his class, History and Bible, uh, did uh, uh, taking care of finding out about our missionary kids. A lot of times we have our missions moment, our missions letter. By the way, who has missions moment tonight? Yeah, okay. Okay. And so why don't you come this way, and then uh, if you have, just give us one report from one missionary, and then we're going to hear some reports from uh, uh, these guys. So if you are scheduled to come and present tonight, I think we have three gentlemen coming, right? And uh, make your way up here also, okay? And uh, while my dad is coming up, why don't you make your way up with your reports, and uh, we're going to hear from that. This is a neat thing, uh, because you don't get to hear a lot from the missionary kids, and so what they have done as part of their project is get in touch with them and have communication with these missionary kids. And you know what? They're over there in a foreign country uh, by themselves. A lot of times they don't have anybody else around, no family, none of their friends. Uh, but it's good that we can just say, hey, we love you. We're praying for you. Uh, tell us what we can tell the church. And so these are some great things to do, okay? So we'll have uh, my dad come, and then we're going to have our guys in whatever order you want to do it. We're going to have them come after that, okay? All right.
Well, I had a long letter and a short one, so I'll give you the short one. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, man, I don't think I've reported this one in a long time. Uh, it, it's our Maritime Ministries, and uh, he calls it the Old Salt Log. And uh, for you who don't know him, that's uh, Brother Bernie Murray. Uh, Bernie Murray was with us years ago in the old building. He repainted our uh, baptistry sign. He just painted over the old one and put the new one right on top of it without erasing the old one. He just painted right over it. A real uh, talk uh, program. He's real good at it, but he uh, entered this maritime ministry some years back, and um, what they do is they go aboard ships at uh, major ports like in uh, Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, and other uh, ports, and they spread out around the country with different ports now that they minister in. And I remember them, I may have told this before, but Bernie Murray, uh, used to come to Ocean Springs in our church there, and he was in college. He met his wife. He didn't have enough money to get her an engagement ring, so he made it out of a bottle cap top and, made <laughs> uh, and gave her the ring for their engagement. They've been together ever since. That must have worked. He starts off by saying, Norma and I have been married eight, uh, 48 years, I have been saved for 51 years and on the ministry for 50 years. We've been using Chalk Talk all these years and have even given some lessons along the way. Brother uh, Creech asked me to draw and preach at the Mariner's house to some Filipino seafarers. He's got a picture of them. And Brother Creech will be having a fish fry at the Port of Mobile on uh, April the 11th, a rather uh, old letter here. This will be the first one since COVID. We feed approximately 400 people, longshoremen, port police, port authorities, seafarers, truckers, and others. This event helps break up hard ground so the word of God can be sown. Miles, the young missionary, has really been a help to Brother Ken. Brother Dewey reports that the ministry in Puerto Rico is moving slowly, but he is encouraged by the fact that the Coast Guard has told the gate guards to allow Chaplain Dewey to board ships to meet the needs of seafarers um, with an amen there. So pray for us as we travel. Recently we returned from Iglesia Batista Nueva Veda in Balch Springs, Texas, whose pastor is Emiliano Paleo. This uh, small congregation pledged over $97,000 to missions. Praise the Lord. Please continue to pray for our health. April the 13th, I will have a medical procedure. We've been to, uh, we've had to pace ourselves, but we're still open for meetings, so please let us know if we can be a blessing to you. Yours to Seaman Bernie and Norma Murray, and uh, that's the Maritime Ministries. So pray for Brother Bernie and his wife Norma. They've uh, been on the battlefield for many years, and they're doing a great job. Good evening. For my missions report, I have the honor to speak to Beckham Reeves from England. So Beckham, Beckham is, he's a junior this year, which is 12th grade. Apparently he was telling me over there in England. So I think it, it goes up to 13 over there. Some things that Beckham likes to do is he likes to go to the gym. He likes to play video games and he even likes to make smoothies. <coughs> He even gave me one of his favorite recipes, which, is, which includes one banana, orange juice, Greek yogurt, and some blueberries. In, uh, um, Beckham has lived in England for a total of nine years, but before that, he lived in the U.S. from ages zero to six, and then 10 through 12. After that, he moved to England. He says his favorite things about the mission field is being to experience a whole different culture, 
and see how people are, operate differently over there. He also says he tries, he tries to help out his church by taking care of the little ones or putting up tables and chairs for the elderly people. And he even helps out with the, with the screens, like the PowerPoints, you know, helping out with the music, uh, the messages, and stuff like that. Beckham also has mentioned that the transportation is way different over there, which is, it's more efficient, he said, that you can walk and you could take public transportation anywhere. And that you don't really need a car, which is kind of bizarre because we all need a car at this over here in San Antonio, right? <coughs> he also mentioned that people over there are less friendly, which is something that threw me off because, I don't know, England, I thought it was like super joyful or like over here in the U.S., but apparently it's like super different, which I didn't know. Uh, I had asked him about his plans for the future, and he had mentioned that he plans to attend Bible college, but he's not quite sure um, what he wants to study for that. And then after all these questions I, I've asked him, he hasn't really re replied, but I mean, I kept on asking him and begging him. I'm pretty sure he's annoyed um, of me by now. But I mean, he's a teenager, so I know I, for myself, I don't really respond much, so I understand. But from the things he has told me, it's like really interesting because for me, I really thought England and the U.S. were very similar. But from what he's told me, it's quite different, which is something that threw me off. But um, I also asked him about a prayer. He didn't really give me one, but I just want to, but before I pray, I just want to give a thank you to Mr. Laurel for giving me this opportunity. You know, after this, whenever he first mentioned it, I was kind of iffy because I was like, it's kind of extra credit. I don't really want to do it, but, uh, but no, 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 it was worth it. It was worth it. Trust me. Yeah. Because, I mean, I learned a lot about England, even though I thought I was going to be very similar to the U.S., but it was really interesting and uh, I even told Beckham that if he ever needs someone to talk to or email, because that's what I was using, I was emailing him, he could always come back and just um, update me, or we could just keep in touch about our futures and stuff like that. So right now, I just want to give a little word of prayer for him and his family and England itself. So let's go. <clears throat> Dear Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for just allowing me to speak to Beckham over there in England, Lord. I just thank you for what you've done to him and his family for uh, um, putting them over there in England, Lord. And I pray that you, I pray that you just do uh, marvelous works over there, Lord. I pray that they just be able to reach out to people and that they just spread the word, Lord. I just pray that they just, uh -um. I pray that they just be a light to others and you just continue helping them be faithful and just do as what you want them to do, Lord. And I thank you once again for everything you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to and get to know Tyler Vist from the Philippines. Is this family a missionary to the Philippines but originally come from Ohio? He is 19 years old and is a senior in high school. He attends Liberty University online and currently pursuing an associate's degree. He also serves in music production in their church. A normal day for Tyler includes reading and attending online school until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. For fun, he enjoys swimming, working out, and playing basketball. Although he enjoys serving in church, there are still things he misses about home, such as his friends, family, home church, and especially the food from home. The hardest, or, yeah, the hardest part he feels about being a missionary kid would be the expectations of others and the pressure people put on him. The best thing is that he gets to see places and he probably wouldn't get to see otherwise. Tyler's prayer needs are for wisdom and discernment for his future there in the Philippines. He asks that you would please pray for the safety of his family and for their church to grow and glorify God and for his brother as he makes the decision to take a job opportunity and return to Ohio or not. Please pray for Tyler that God will give him the knowledge and lead him in the correct path. What I have learned from this assignment is that being a missionary kid can be very difficult because of all the pressure put on them. Despite this, God will always provide as long as you're doing his will. Thank you.
Good evening. So my missionary pal is Dakota Pickett um, from the Pickett family. He is a, he's a senior this year as well as me, and uh, he is a missionary kid to Great Britain. Dakota and I have something in common in that we both love basketball, and we're both um, sons of people who are in ministry. And his hobbies currently are basketball, working out, and playing the guitar. Dakota and I didn't have the opportunity to talk much more due to Dakota's university work and part-time work with a plumber. So I think he responded like one time. So that's all I wrote. And his, his, but his dad sent me some missionary letters. So that's what I'm going to read for you all today. Um, and I just I kind of picked out some parts here because if I read the whole letter, I'd be like my dad. And I'd be, uh, I'd be long. I'd be going long. Every time I get up here, I got to say a joke about that. So <laughs> let me get that one out. So uh, <laughs> I got one from winter and I got one from spring. Uh, the one from winter says, starts off like this. We need help. Everything is white and ready to be harvested, but there just aren't enough laborers. We are currently ministering and growing in the village of Brimpton. The work is growing, and we've seen 12 more new people attending since we've been here. And then he says, we are attempting to start a church in the city of Bath, which is one and a half hours away. Uh, and then he starts saying it's hard to start a church and minister to the person who's going to be the pastor there because um, it's a half an hour away. So uh, it's a long way to be um, ministering to him. But he says he's thankful for apps that allow him to stay in communication with uh, the group. And, and then he says, please, play, please pray for this work, and please sincerely pray if God can use you to meet this need. Um, even though England is 75% atheist, God is still calling the lost to salvation. And that's a very interesting statistic that I learned uh, even through this letter. And then he says, we are surprised with the different ways God is allowing us to meet new people Ruth Ann has started a group, a program called Slimming World. It, he says it's similar to Weight Watchers and is doing great. However, the better thing is that she is meeting new people. And the leader of the group has offered to go on some longish walk, area walks with Ruth Ann, introducing her to more people in the village. What a brilliant opportunity to make friends and give the gospel. He finishes this letter by saying, our church did some local Christmas caroling. This was back in... Um, the winter of 2023, and uh, or 22. I am asking God to let them see me as someone they can talk to when the troubles of li this life overwhelm them. Pray that I will be able to keep a good testimony to those who need to hear the good news. And then the one from spring of 2023, he starts off by saying, a few days ago, a dear friend asked if I was going to the coronation. My answer was sort of. That Saturday, I was not going to see the coronation of King Charles III over an earthly kingdom, but instead I was overseeing an ordination service of a new pastor. And uh, it says, please, please pray for Pastor Christopher Pierce as he leads Kingsmen uh, Baptist Church in the service to king, the King of Kings. Um, he says another great blessing that he had is he had the privilege of leading a gentleman to God, to the Savior. Some, someone communicated with me a few weeks ago that he was going through some hard personal things. He says, we meet up at a Starbucks to discuss how things, um, to get things back on track. And while talking, the Holy Spirit prompted him to ask him why he thought he was a Christian. He mentioned that after seeing God do tremendous miracles in his family's life, he knew that he could no longer deny God's existence. I told him that I told him that that was a good thing, but how did that make him a Christian? A Christian, excuse me. He further mentioned that he would start doing better and started going to church. I told him that those things were good too, but how did that make him a Christian? After speaking to him about his true need not to do good things, but to repent of his sins and trust Jesus Christ as his Savior, he realized he was lost and needed to be saved. He trusted Christ that afternoon, and he's been growing ever since. Please pray. Please pray for him as he grows and leads his family in righteousness. Another important prayer request involves the real responsibility that the United Kingdom is closing to foreign missionaries and church planters. 
many missionaries who are currently here are being told they may need to leave. So please pray for all those missionaries. Uh, he said they are fine um, because they've, they've been there for a while. Um, but there's some new missionaries that are coming that are having to, that the government's telling them you need to leave. Um, so it's, it's another country that's being close to closing to um, the gospel. So we need to really pray over that. Um, and then he says, uh, we have a Bible camp coming up, but many children will not be able to attend unless they are financially assisted. He says the price of the camp is about $280 per child, and we need help with 10 children. So uh, would you please pray by sponsoring one of these children uh, or slash teens to spend a week at Bible camp? Um, also, he says, God has blessed us with a beautiful sanctuary and fellowship hall for which we are very grateful. But these buildings were built in 1843 and are now 180 years old and are in need for some major repairs. So uh, those are some prayer requests. And then he says, he ends it by saying, thank you for your support. Love and continual prayers, we are thankful for you. Because of his great love, Damien Pickett. They did good, didn't they? Thank you guys for uh, you, all of your help and work with that. And uh, we have some others that are going to present uh, over the next several weeks too. That's a great project for them to be able to kind of see what our missionary kids, what they go through on the field and so I appreciate them doing that, all right? Well, if you have your Bibles, Genesis 44, Genesis chapter 44, I will not be long, as Chase said, okay? <laughs> Just because he said that. If you, have, if you have it, let's stand together. We're going to read the entire chapter, but I'm going to read it fast, okay? So you follow, listen fast, and I'll speak fast, all right? Genesis 44, beginning in verse number 1. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his uh, corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, up, follow after the men, and when thou dost uh, overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Yet have done evil in so doing, or ye have done so evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servant should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouth, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless." Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judas uh, and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Why ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servant, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so. Uh, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you... Get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ear, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. 
And thou said unto the servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Except your younger brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, we came up unto thy servant, my father. We told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother uh, be with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come uh, to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil, that shall come on my Father. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless the reading of your word tonight, open our hearts and minds to what you'd have for us from your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I read the entire chapter because the the story that we're going to look at tonight involves the entire chapter tonight. Let me start by saying this. God uses strange ways to speak to the hearts of people. God has always done that. Uh, The Bible is filled with story after story in which God used unusual methods and whatever means that God had to get the attention of certain people in the Bible. Uh, Think about these cases. How about Moses? How did God talk to Moses? Come on, Bible students. How did he speak to him? Burning bush. Now, is that a little unusual? Does God still speak that way to us now? No, he doesn't. How about Balaam? What did God use in that story? A donkey. Have you ever heard a talking donkey? And I'm not talking about Shrek, okay? God used a donkey to speak to the pagan prophet, King Saul. Do you remember in in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God used the bleeding of some sheep to speak to this wayward king, the widow at Zarephath. How did God speak to her? God used an empty mill barrel and a dead son to speak to this poor widow woman uh, in the book of 1 Kings. Elijah, God used a a touch, a meal, and a small, still voice to speak to this discouraged prophet. How did God speak to Naaman? You know what? God used an Israelite little girl to speak to this great general about how there was a God who could heal him. Think of Simon Peter in the New Testament. God used a rooster to speak to this fallen preacher. And you know what? The list could go on and on for quite a while, but those are just a few instances. And you know what? You may have some other ones come into your mind. Let me tell you this. God will use whatever means necessary to penetrate the heart of humanity with the message that he wants someone to hear. And you know what? God... If he needs to speak to you, he will use whatever means. Do you know that? God will get his message across to his people. I began to think of my own life. I can think of ways over the years of my life that God has gotten my attention. How about you? God will use any means necessary. So I think this passage teaches us the same truth, that God will get his message, his message across. So as the story of Joseph and his brothers continues to unfold as we have walked through these chapters, God uses this time a simple silver cup to open the door to forgiveness and reconciliation with Joseph and his brothers. After all these years, 
God brings the guilty brothers of Joseph to a place of repentance through the ministry of what I would call Joseph's silver cup. Now, you may have never dug into the story, but I'm telling you, there's a word for us tonight in this story, and I want you to listen uh, for just a few minutes tonight. So as this chapter kind of unfolds, kind of like a mystery, I believe that we can see how God used a simple silver cup to soften the hearts of Jacob's brothers. So I think there's three parts of this story that unfold to us. Let me give you those real quick tonight. First of all, it involved a conspiracy. Verses 1 through 9, as we read, Joseph and his brothers have enjoyed a time of celebration. You go back to chapter 43, uh, they uh, had a celebration time. Uh, And in fact, Joseph did that. The Bible says that they uh, enjoyed a great time. If you look, he threw a feast there in, in verses 31 through 34 of chapter 43. And then the brothers, let me remind you though, they don't even know who this is. They don't know it's Joseph. They still, are, they still do not know who it is. And in fact, do you remember the last time we, we, we gave you? Remember when they sat down at the feast? Joseph, he, they sat down in order of their birth, they sat in their birth order. Who would have known that but their own brother? They still didn't get it. And, and also, Benjamin's, uh, Benjamin, which we read about in this text, was Joseph's only full, uh, full brother. That was, his, that was his full brother. The others were half-brothers. Um, he's given so much more food. You remember the story about Benjamin? He had more food than they. In fact, he was given a whole lot of rest. No, the rest of them didn't. Now the meal is over. We come to chapter 44. The next day has come upon us. The brothers are feeling pretty good about things. They've convinced the prime minister of Egypt that they're not spies. They've rescued their brother Simeon from prison. Remember, Joseph had thrown him in prison. And they're about to return home with more grain for the family all their money, and most importantly, they're returning home with Benjamin, just as Judah had promised his father. If you remember, dad didn't want Benjamin to go. He thought something's going to happen to him. You can't go. He's my only. He's my son. I love him. He's all I got. Don't take him. But Judah, remember, he talked to his dad and said, we have to do this in order to get food. If not, we're going to die. So we see that In chapter 44, the the morning comes and the men, the Bible says they take their grain and their animals and they set out towards home. And no doubt they were filled with excitement and they set out towards home and uh, they were going home to their families and all of their children. And no doubt they are congratulating themselves over a successful mission to Egypt. But what they don't know is that God is working behind the scenes to bring them face to face with the sin that they committed some 22 years ago. Here's the story. So while the men are preparing to leave, Joseph tells his steward, the steward of the house, the manager of the house, may, may, that's probably a better term. He said, go and prepare the grain that they need. Give them as much as they can carry. And then he tells the steward to give them their money back also. They had done this before, you remember? Again, he says, hey, give them their money back. Then Joseph tells the steward to do something very strange. He says, hey, I want you to take uh, my personal cup, Joseph said, I want you to take my cup and place it in the sack of young Benjamin. Now, what is Joseph doing here? So he does that. And then as soon as they leave, Joseph goes back to the steward and says, hey, I want you to go and chase after them and find them. So he does, as we read the story. They find this caravan, and they stop them. And, and, and so the steward goes and confronts them about the cup. And he says, you know what? We're going to search everybody because the cup of the prime minister is missing. So they take everybody's grain out. And they, I would imagine this is what they did. They took every man, because every man had a sack of grain. They put the sack right in front of him, and here's the steward uh, and the manager. He would go and look in the sack, and he started with the eldest, and he went all the way down to the youngest. And where did they find it? In Benjamin's sack. 
So what happens here? So the steward follows, and in, in, in the scripture we just read, he accuses them of rewarding evil for good. And he accuses them of stealing Joseph's cup in verse 6. And the brothers, of course, they deny that charge, and they want to defend their honor. So they remind the steward that they have plenty of money. So it's not likely that they would steal a cup. Remember, Jacob had a lot of cattle. He had a lot of money. They were rich. It wasn't that they needed money. They needed food. So they brought money to use that. So they said, you know what? We're innocent. We don't even need this. I think it's a strange way that Joseph is kind of doing this. Why is he doing this? This is a strange story, isn't it? Uh, In this passage, though, I just believe this. Nothing happens to us by accident. You believe that tonight? I just believe that God ordains everything that goes on in our life. And sometimes God allows things to come in our life to get our attention. This is what's happening here. So I believe God uses Joseph as his instrument to draw these men to a place of repentance and restoration. We know what happens. We know what they did some 22 years ago. But I want us to remember this tonight, that there are no accidents in life with God. Did you know that? It's not, you ever have something happen and you think, boy, God must be, what is God doing? You think it's an accident. It's not an accident with God. Don't forget that God is sovereign, folks. God ordains everything. God knows all things. He is all-knowing. If you're a child of God, every event in your life is a product of divine providence. Did you know that? You see, God is working out His will in your life in ways that you and I cannot even comprehend. God is working around us right now. Isaiah 55, and it says, God's ways, His ways are not our ways. If you think you can understand what God is doing, you have a problem because His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. God is not like that. I think there are times in our lives when we allow sin to kind of abide in our lives, and after a while, we grow used to sin's presence in our lives. You realize it no longer bothers us? Do you hear me tonight? Are you there? Are you still there tonight? We let sin get in our lives, and you know what? We live with it so long that it doesn't bother us anymore. Let me tell you, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. I pray every day, God, continue to convict me of things in my life that's wrong. I never want to get to the place where I'm just complacent about sin, and and it doesn't bother me anymore. It ought to bother you, folks. Sin ought to bother you so much that you can't sleep without getting it right. And you ought to, by the way, why not just pray that prayer? God, don't, don't let me sleep till I get this right in my life. Boy, I tell you what, we, we have to realize that God knows exactly where we are in our lives, and God knows how to speak to us. So many things. So what is the point of him? In fact, as I began to read, I thought, chapter 44, but this kind of is right in the middle here, and we're talking about the life of Joseph, and we're thinking, what is God doing here? Why did Joseph do this? I just believe that God is trying to get our attention, and that's what was happening here. So what do we do when God comes to us? And God allows things to come into our lives, and it's for a purpose. It's for God to teach us some things, or maybe it's to to make sure that there's an error in our life that's not right that we need to get right. Let me just say this tonight. you got to listen, and then you got to get right. Don't try to argue with God. And let me tell you, that doesn't work. You're going to lose every time if you're trying to argue with God. So this is what was going on here. And let me just say, we may not understand it all, but that is what is happening in these verses. God is in the process of burning the barley fields of these brothers of Joseph, and God is in the process of getting their attention. He is conspiring to bring them back to himself. Secondly, it involved a confrontation. So as we read in verses 10 through 13, so the sacks are open, they're searched, and the brothers know they have done nothing wrong. They're innocent, right? They didn't do this. Can you see them standing there with the smug expression on their face thinking, 
Well, they're not going to find anything in my sack because we've not done anything wrong. But as they open the sack, they find the silver cup. Imagine as they open Benjamin's sack and the sun kind of begins to uh, gleam uh, off the piece of highly polished metal. Here it was, Joseph's silver cup. And to their disbelief, here it was. This is the moment of truth, right? This is Joseph's final test for his brothers. In fact, in my Bible, over chapter 44, you know what it says? It may say it in yours. Joseph's final test. There it is. Joseph's final test. You see, all this time, Joseph has been testing them to see whether or not they're the same brothers that threw him into the pit and sold him and told their dad that he was killed. Joseph is testing and trying to see, are these guys, my brothers, have they changed any? They've already passed several tests. You remember this in chapter 43? The test was, you go bring Benjamin back to me because I want you to do that. Did they bring him? Yes, they did. They passed the test. Then they returned, uh, they returned for Simeon, which Joseph threw Simeon in prison. They passed that test. Now they even returned all the grain money that had been given back to them. Remember when they came back? They brought all the money back. So Joseph is like, okay, check here, check here, check here. Now it's the final test. This is the ultimate test. You see, remember, 22 years later, they had hated Joseph so much, they attacked him, they cast him in a pit, sold him into slavery. They broke their father's heart by lying to him about what happened to Joseph, and they maintained that lie for all these years. Now they have the opportunity to get rid of the other son of Rachel. So it's clear, I think, from the text tonight that Jacob certainly loved Benjamin, right? I think you see that. It's clear that Benjamin had replaced Joseph as his father's favorite son, We see that here. So again, these men pass the test. They don't know how this cup got in Benjamin's sack. In fact, at this point, uh, this particular fact doesn't even matter, but they're determined to face whatever comes. So you know what they did? The Bible says they rent their clothes. You know what that means? They tore their clothes. That was a sign of grief, of repentance, and they're willing to go back to face Joseph. And this is where we are in this text. One thing I see about this, and I don't know about you, I do see they've changed. They're not trying to accuse anybody else, right? They're not trying to lie about it. God has worked in their heart already so much that they are going to face the music. They're going to go back and face Joseph. So we already see God is using this to change them. And you know what? For you and I, that's exactly the place that God wants us to get to. He wants us to come to the place where we stop making excuses for our behavior, right? He wants us to come to the place where we're willing to own up to our sin. You know what? God wants us to stop pointing the finger at other people. God wants us to say, my sins are not my parents' fault. I can't blame my evil on my wife or my surroundings, if I'm going to enjoy cleansing and forgiveness from God, I have to deal with my sins openly and honestly. And you know what, folks? We have to get to the point where we have to realize that to have the power of God in my life, then I've got to do the right thing. I've got to do it. See, God wants us to to reach us to the place where we're willing to do the right thing, regardless of personal cost. Let me ask you, have you reached that place? Have have I reached that place? We can with God's help. I don't know about you, but I want to be at that place. I want to be at that place in my life to not allow complacency and sin just to fester and linger there. You see, as I said at the beginning, God is not afraid to confront us at the very point of our sins in order to open our eyes for the need of repentance. There are Christians that go through life and they let sin just stay in their life and they never make it right. God help us to get to the place where we will not live a a moment with sin in our lives. Sin should be confessed immediately, folks. Do you hear me? 
It should be confessed completely and honestly. When it is, the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you know what? When we are clean and pure before God, then God can flow the blessings freely in our lives. So lastly, we see it was involved a confession. In fact, verses 14, chapter 44, all the way through verse 34. Let me finish this up tonight. When the brothers arrive back at Joseph's palace, they find Joseph still there, according to verse 14. And no doubt Joseph was waiting to see who would show up. Would it be Benjamin alone? Or would the rest of the brothers be with him? By the way, I think this little trick might have been Joseph's way of protecting Benjamin from his brothers. You ever thought about that? When the brothers appear before Joseph, what does it say? They bowed themselves to the ground before him. And again, you know what this does? This fulfills the dreams that Joseph had in back in Genesis 37. You remember the dream? That these sheaves are going to bow down before me. And that's what made his brothers so mad. See, Joseph confronts his brothers about the silver cup. And he leads them to believe that he was able to see what they had done because his uh, ability. And you know the word that he used here? His ability to divine. You know what that means? You take that, uh, that Hebrew word, it means to foresee into the future. He led them believe, you know, that he had the ability to be able to know because he said, should you not know that anybody that can uh, be able to tell who took the cup, it would be me. Again, another uh, clue as to who this was. This was Joseph. Joseph had the ability because God gave him the ability. Divination was a popular uh, uh, skill that they thought they had there in ancient Egypt. In fact, sometimes, and I was reading this, and history talks about sometimes diviners of the divination, they would take a silver cup, they would put wine in it along with jewels, and they would read the jewels like some people try to read tea leaves. You ever heard of that before? Of course, divination does not work. And by the way, Joseph did not practice black magic, which you know what? There are false prophets that teach that. Well, Joseph wasn't a type of Christ, and Joseph had all this, and Joseph was practicing black magic. That is not true. That's not what he was doing, by the way. So at this point, we see Joseph steps forward and delivers, I believe, one of the most profound and eloquent speeches in the Word of God. Look down at verse 16. I want to read this verse again. Uh, uh, what shall we speak of my Lord, uh, or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, speaking to Joseph, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your fathers. What is he doing? I think Judah confesses sin. And he doesn't name names, but he confesses the fact that they have sinned and that God was punishing them for their sin. And Joseph speaks to them. They still don't know who it is. I don't know about you, I've been reading this, I'm thinking, how could they not know that this was their brother that they had sold into slavery 22 years ago? Begin to think about this and realize the fact that Satan blinds the eyes of people. Did you know that? And this is exactly what was happening here. You wonder why people will continue to do things and they, they don't sense that God is moving and working in their life. It's because Satan has blinded them. In fact, that's one of the tools that Satan uses. He blinds your eyes from the truth. Down in verse 17, Joseph refuses Judah's offer and tells him that the rest of the brothers go home. He tells them that Benjamin will have to stay as a slave. And then verse 18 through the end of the chapter, I think these are the heart of Judah's speech. He reminds Joseph that the only reason that Benjamin had come with them was because Joseph demanded it, right? Judah then tells Joseph that Jacob will die. He will die if I don't bring Benjamin back. Next, Judah offers himself in Benjamin's place. He says, listen, I'll stay in Egypt as your slave so that Benjamin can return to Canaan with the older brothers. 
This is a moment that Joseph's been waiting for and working. You know what? Now he sees they're different. They're changed. Why are they changed? God's been working in their hearts. Can you see this over the past probably three chapters? How God has been working and working and working. Now we see there's a difference. This is what Joseph has been waiting for. This is, I believe, a major turning point in this story. So when Joseph hears Judah's confession and Joseph sees his love for his family, it's more than he can stand. And if you go down to verse 45, we see then, look at these words, then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried. Now, I'm not going to look at this tonight. We're going to look at this next time. But we see that Joseph breaks down and his brother, and he tells them who he is. So what is the lesson here of chapter 44? I think there's a lesson that we need to take to heart. First of all, I believe Judah shows us how sin is to be handled. I think Judah's actions remind us of the very sin nature that you and I have. Now, don't forget, what gets saved about you when you get saved? It's your soul. It's not your sin nature. Why do you keep sinning, child of God? Because you have a sin nature. Why? why do you 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 ever thought, I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing this? Because you have a sin nature. That's why the Apostle Paul said, what do you have to do? You have to crucify. I'm crucified with... Christ, yet nevertheless I live, not not yet I, but Christ liveth in me. It's a daily process where you have to crucify your flesh because your flesh is going to want to sin every day. We know that, church, don't we? Sunday night crowd. So why don't we do it? And I'm speaking to myself. Why do we choose to go out of our doors in the morning and not crucify the flesh. Just being honest, right? How many times do we go about and start our day? And you know what? We may even get in our word. I hope you do. I hope you get in the word every day. And you pray and all these things. And you mean to do well. You mean to crucify the flesh. But you know what? We just don't do it. And we go out. And because of our sinful flesh, we sin throughout the day maybe in what we say maybe maybe in a thought maybe in a deed but yet we still choose to do that see sin by nature is a very selfish thing did you know that and so i believe the story here is how do we handle sin you see when sin entered the world why did it why did it come it's because satan got in and tempted Eve, right? It entered Eve, sin entered Eve because Eve was selfish. Did you know that? By the way, that's our nature to be selfish, isn't it? What about me? What happened with Eve? She chose herself over the Lord. Did you know that? When sin entered the universe, it entered through selfishness. In fact, how did Satan get thrown out of heaven? Isaiah chapter 14. You know what it was? Selfishness. I, can, I want to be like God. I can do this. I can do that. You know, it's all about what I can do. I, I, I. And, and you know what? We're living in the I generation, aren't we? I. Humanistic views. Humanist, humanism everywhere. You have everything within you to do anything that you want to do. It's all you. No. Let me tell you, you can do nothing without God. You see, every sin that we commit now is rooted in selfishness. Did you know that? Our sins are all about us. When we we sin, we choose ourselves over every other person. And you know what we're saying? We're saying, I want what I want, and I don't care about the consequences. That's exactly what sin is. Because listen, don't we all know the consequences of sin, right? But still we do it because of our sin nature. Sin is rooted in selfishness. But when our hearts are as they should be, here's the way it ought to be. The Lord, 
His will and the needs of others should come before our own desires. You know you are making progress in the Lord when you refuse to sin because of how it will affect the Lord's work and because of how it will affect other people. You know you're growing when you actually care about what you do because how it will affect other people. Well, that's a great uh, thermometer. It's a great uh, to look and say, hey, where am I spiritually tonight? Do you realize that most people turn away from sin because they're afraid of being caught? A mature believer, though, looks at sin and sees the damage that it can do to other people, to your family, to your church, to the community. That's what a mature Christian will look at. The only way to get past sin is to deal with it honestly. That's exactly what Judah had done. If you read, again, you can go read it either again. I'm not going to read it. Verse 14 all the way through verse 34. And Judah gives a wonderful speech. Yes, I hear the alarm. I'm done. <laughs> Here's the conclusion. In 3 John verse 4, by the way, this is one of my favorite verses. John says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I love that verse because I have that in my office and I got my three kids up there. But did you realize that the context of that verse is not so much about my children as it is about we as his children? I don't think there's anything wrong with the context of that. I have no greater joy to know that my children walk in truth. But I believe this is the Heavenly Father saying, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. His children, you and I, that are the children of God. John was saying that the greatest joy as a preacher or as an apostle was to see also people that he ministered to growing and walking in truth as he's taught them. And you know what? I know how he feels. I have no greater joy in my life as your pastor to know that you're walking in truth. Nothing brings greater joy. And for you as a parent, nothing should bring greater joy than to know that your children are walking in truth. You that impart knowledge to children, to young people, you teachers, right? We have a lot of teachers in our church. There should be no greater joy than to know that your children walk in truth. You public school teachers, there's very much that you can't do. You can pray for them. You can be the example of Jesus Christ to them. Where when they look at you, they don't see you. They see Jesus Christ. And that's the way it ought to be. The example. This is, this is exactly, though, the same feeling that must have gripped the heart of Joseph as he looked at and he saw and heard what his brothers said. The brothers of Joseph had finally grown up and they were ready to make things right. So as I bring these thoughts to a close, let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, are you growing in the Lord? Are you growing in the Lord tonight? How would you know? You can know that you're growing in your relationship with the Lord when you began to hate sin. That's what this story is all about. You know you're growing when you're willing to tell the truth about your sins and be honest with yourself. You're growing when you reach the place where you're more concerned about others than you are about yourself. So are you growing in the Lord? Number two. Are there sins in your life that need to be confessed? Maybe you need to get before the Lord tonight and deal with some sin in your life. Maybe you need to go to someone that maybe you've hurt and confess that hurt to them. You know what? Things will never be as they could until you do those things. Did you know that? We got to do right. And number three, are you afraid that there may be a silver cup in your future? What was the silver cup all about? God was using that to bring them to a place. 
If you know there are areas in your life that are not where they need to be with the Lord, and maybe this, you fear that He might resort to drastic measures to get your attention, why not come to Him and deal with the matter now? Because you know what? He's going to deal with it one way or the other. But aren't you thankful for a faithful God that says, confess your sins, and I'm faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And my relationship with you can be restored. Isn't that a great God we serve? Don't wait for a silver cup moment in your life. And by the way, did you know that if sin is on your mind right now, you know what that is? It's the Holy Spirit calling you to come to God and deal with it right now. In my opinion, it's far better to come before the Lord in a humble repentance than it is to wait for Him to burn your barley fields and have a silver cup moment in your life. What a lesson for us. So many great truths in the life of Joseph. Let's stand together tonight. Father, I thank you for your word. Again, Lord, so many times we gloss over these passages without really truly taking a moment to think about, God, why did you put this in the Bible for us today? God, I think after going through this, Lord, I pray that we have seen, God, that you will use whatever means necessary to draw us back to you, to get us to the place, God, that we will listen to you. God, will get things right. And Lord, restore our relationship with you. And so, Father, I thank you for your word. And I pray, dear God, whenever we hear a sermon or whenever we're reading through the Bible and we read this part about the silver cup, God, I pray it will prompt our hearts to make whatever needs to be made right with you, and we do it immediately. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the conviction of your word. And Lord, bless a short invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you, if the Lord has prompted you, and let me tell you what, that's the Holy Spirit of God. Whatever it is, it may not be some deep sin. But let me remind you that every sin is sin. There are no degrees of sin. So if it's a bad thought or if it's odd against your brother, whatever it is, let me tell you what, make it right. Don't continue to live in such a way that God has to have a silver cup moment with you in your life. Let's take the instruction of the Word of God, let's apply it to our lives, and let's do business with God. As our musicians play, we're going to sing a verse of invitation. Some have already come. You do what God needs you to do in your life tonight. You come. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to Thee. Amen. Is everything right? Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, Lord, let it be. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the Word of God? And uh, I love going through the life of Joseph and taking moments to see what God has for us from His Word. And so uh, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, went a little longer than normal, and I not because Chase said that, but... And so uh, thank you for your attention tonight, all right? pray you have a wonderful, wonderful week, and uh, go out and share the gospel of Christ, and let's be witnesses for him, all right? I do believe there's a bus meeting.
So bus captains, please go to that. And by the way, we need, we need others involved in that ministry. Uh, I was talking to Brother Richard this morning. God is blessing that ministry. We have seen people come to church. We've seen people saved. And boy, I tell you what, that is a needy thing. Running five, five routes now, four routes. We want to do five. We need drivers. We need captains. We need all that. And uh, so if God were to uh, speak to you about that, go to the meeting. Find out what it's all about. And uh, always needed in that. And let me tell you what, it's, it's, tough, it's tough work. It's a lot of work. But it's so very rewarding when you see those boys and girls and teenagers and adults come and, and they're saved and their lives are forever changed. And boy, I tell you what, that's a wonderful ministry. And so I would encourage you to get involved in that. All right? Let's bow in prayer and don't forget those requests I made earlier. And uh, continue to pray for the De Leons and uh, Jen Martinez and uh, the family of Brother Ron's aunt and uh, others that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Valerie Vargas, that uh, she was here this morning. It was so good to see her. And I think she had to kind of step out and go lay down in the car and uh, just not overdo it, but uh, continue to pray for her and do that. All right, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night, okay? And uh, let's be dismissed. And I tell you what, Brother Rick Laurel, thank you for all your work uh, with, our, with our kids. And I enjoyed that tonight. Why don't you dismiss us in prayer, Brother Rick? Our minds, our prayer is that we take this message and we apply it to our, our lives. And we pray for our missionaries, we pray for our, our academy as we get ready to finish our second year, that we will finish strong, Lord, and we'll finish faithful. Thank you, Lord, for again the forgiveness of our sins, for your promises, your word, for that promise, Lord, that you're coming back to us. Yes. Help us to be prepared for that day, and until then, we might be confident. Amen. Dismiss us with your love and care, in Jesus' name. Amen.